So what I'm talking about this morning is a continuation of what we've been teaching, talking about over the last two weeks um, with reference to the nature of this community and what God is doing. And it's not so much in bringing you something new. I am gathering all the things that have been happening to us in our journey over the past 20 years and sort of it's now starting to coalesce. We're getting closer and closer to a point and so we need to get a little bit sharper in a lot of things as well. Uh, um, and we, we um, so, so we, we're getting clarification now. I, I, I'll encourage you to go back. Um, if you haven't got the, the semi app for your phone, you should try and get it. Talk to Justin or Kevin or Chris or Mal or Dan and they can help you download that so you can access these the sermons and go back over them. I say that, um, not sort of saying, I'm saying that in particular just because this series, as I said, the one I gave the week before Mother's Day is the most important sermon I've ever preached in my life. I'm not saying it's the best, I'm saying it's the most important, significant in terms of the life of this community and our journey with God. So, um, um, we, we're talking about, we're focusing, we're talking about a Hesed community. We're talking about, which Hesed simply means sticky love. It's a Hebrew word, it means sticky love, sticky attachment. It means hanging together no matter what. And about um, Kaste or any one of the other six or seven different pronunciations I gave you last week apparently, um, that's that's fine. I, g- I gave you Jim Wilder's pronunciation. I gave you the the pronunciation from the the um, dictionary I looked up, and I gave you about four versions of mine. Um, so you can sort of work it through. But that word is the Hebrew word for stick-necked, being stiff-necked, or being mean-spirited, or being hard. And uh, so we talk about the importance of those as we do something that Jim Wilder refers to as developing peopleness developing peopleness and so that's really what we're wanting to particularly focus on to develop peopleness amongst us and and um, I just love that expression you won't find the word in your Oxford dictionary we've made it up he's made it up and I think it's a great word I really do developing peopleness okay so that's allowing Christ's love to be manifest through all of us so I'm going to go over a little bit just to keep building on what it is um, but I'm building on what's being shared over the past three weeks, so you n- really need to go back to look at that. Now, uh, this actually I originally had this little cartoon because of where I was thought I was going, but I'm not actually going where I was. But I thought it's still appropriate. You're out fishing, and you suddenly net in. You're out on a little tinny, and you catch a big shark. What's necessary? Well, like the guys say, we're going to need a bigger boat. And as we're coming into new things in God. We're going to need a bigger boat, except the boat's mostly inside us. Okay, we need to get bigger inside is, is really the point of that. But we'll come back to that when we get to the real point of doing that um, sometime in the future. Now, we know God is up for something. We've heard him speak to us. We know what's in his word. We know God is up to something, and we know that God wants us, as he always says, he wants us to love one another, but he's really focusing in on that, and he's up to something. And so we need... We know that when God speaks, we need to shama. And shama is another Hebrew word. And I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I don't know any. But by the way, just a little disclaimer. I actually don't know Hebrew. I just look the stuff up, okay? So um, shama is is a word that I I love this description. It's best translated as to hear, to heed, to understand, and then to obey. And we saw an an illustration of that. And Mary's going through talking about honey. What's labeling? What's... What's getting someone to do label jars on honey for? Well, it's actually part of a prophetic word that God spoke over us as a community back in 2005. You see, there's, there's, and it's all interrelated, so it's not just all kingdom business. It's actually kingdom business related to health. There's a whole process that goes on as we talk about these things. So, now, God's always spoken to his people about loving one another. That's his heart. It's the key thing in relationship, being with one another, relating to one another, not living alone, is the fundamental of the architecture of our existence. God said in Genesis, it's not good for man to live alone. So we know that. Now, in our journey together, 
we've discovered that to love one another, we actually have to relate to one another. Now, that sounds like a no-brainer, um, but we found that, that, yeah, we could love one another with, as a concept, but to actually do it meant we have to relate, and that can be hard because there's all these things that affect us in the way that we, we relate, and so we started to do all these brain schools. We've got the chart just around the corner there, and I'm really going to draw that out today. I really want to, there's some practical things I want us to see as we're talking about this loving, but just, just laying the scriptural basis once again. Now, we've also seen in becoming a, a community that is known for its sticky attachment that we know that, that in the whole process of our, of, of our development as people, we know that from the age of, of 13, our brain changes. It sheds a lot of its... Um, stuff and we become more focused on group identity rather than individual identity and in fact we only, the only place we change is in a in the context of a group we actually become a people and we've focused on the scripture from peter um, 1 peter 9 and 10 you are not like that for you are a chosen people already there's identity that's that's defining something with something special about us in god's sight we're a chosen people a holy nation, royal priests, God's own possession. That's a great description of a believing community. As a result of that, you can show others the goodness of God. For we've been called out of darkness into his wonderful light once you had no identity as a people. But now we have identity as a people. And that's a really key thing in this process. Once we had no identity as a people, now we are God's people. Now, loving, has ne loving God has never been, and loving one another, has, has never been an option. Where, well, can you, you know, make a choice? You can choose to love or not. I don't really care, says God. He doesn't say that. He's always wanted us to do it. And had we really read Scripture with an intensity and a bit more sharma, then maybe we wouldn't have had to wait till brain science came along to help us understand the very architecture of human life. So the scripture I referred to, Genesis 2.18, it's not good for man to live alone. Remember, he said that when God and man were like that. I was only going to say thick as thieves, but that's a totally inappropriate way to express it. But they're so close. God and man were together. Okay, God and man were together. And God said, even in that context, it's not good for man to live alone. Let's never forget that. It's not good. We're made to be in relationship with other people. So John 17, 21, Jesus' prayer, I pray that they'll all be one, just as this is Jesus praying to the Father, just as you and I are one. John 3, uh, 13, 20, uh, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And... Then there's other scriptures that too we've got to be, co be, con be conscious of. What about being thankful? How often do we live a life this way? So Chronicles 16, 1 Chronicles 16.34 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 15, and part, part of verse 17, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You get the message? God is saying something about appreciation. We actually know appreciation is the key in relationships. There's a bit more in case you missed the first bit. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Psalm 100 verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Psalm, oh sorry, Hebrews 12, 28, therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And then another psalm, Psalm 106 verse 1, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And we saw that back in 1 Chronicles 16.34. Appreciation is the key. Now, they're just some verses we pull out of the Bible. How much are we really working them through into our lives? Like I said, see, we actually had to wait because we 
then, you know, we're only seeing dimly to really understand the implication of so many of those verses. We've actually had to wait for brain science to come and point us out a, a, a few things to us. Now, we want God-connected people because we know the people, our, who our people are determine who we are. We want people, and I love this, who can say, let's together see what God has created in you and in me. Let's together find out what God's put within us. I love that concept. That we actually have such an attachment to one another, such a sticky attachment that we can actually allow others to help us in our identity, understanding who, our, who, who we are. And we know that our people aren't selected by us. I mean, our people can be family, our people can be friends, workmates. We're talking particularly now in the context of Generation E as a community. These are my people. You are my people. You help me determine, you help me understand my identity. Together we find out who God's, is, what's God's put within me. That's what's happening. And it does incredible things for you. Now, we, we said a couple of weeks ago to, to help us in this process of helping Generation E, helping us to accept Generation E as our people, we need to further develop two things. And I say further development because this is, as I said from the beginning, this is really drawing together our journey over the past 20 years. This is really what's being drawn together now. We need more hesed, which is, remember, is more sticky love, sticky attachment to other people. To be so glued to one another that we take our identity from you and, and the background to that, you need to go back to the previous, previous sermons. So that we can together answer the question, what's it like me and my people to do in this situation? Because the Bible doesn't tell you what to do in every situation. Remember we saw a couple of weeks ago and we started this, obviously a set up by God, but we had two people outside church, not from this community, but two people who were wandering around outside somewhere and they're having a fight. It was a domestic and they're having a fight. What do you do when you see come across two people having a fight? And we went through the whole process. What is it like me and my people to do when two people are having a fight? And we worked out that we pray and offer them a cup of tea because that's what happened. Do you remember? And, and a muffin, of course. No, don't forget the muffin. But you see, because we don't always necessarily know, because the Bible doesn't list down every situation, so sometimes I've got to say, hey, listen, guys, what do I do? What, what should I do in this situation? Or I ask myself the question, what is it like me and my people to do? And I'm saying me, not just in terms of my own knowledge, but because... I'm living from a heart that Jesus, that when I'm living from the heart that Jesus gave me, what is it like me? You know, that, remember that movement, what, what would Jesus do? And I say, what would Jesus do and what would us as his people do? Because it all happens within a community context. Okay. So we, we saw that belonging and working together, does, even though it's important, it doesn't necessarily make it easier or more successful. Working with other people, you know the old thing, oh, if you want something done, you do it yourself? Well, there's a certain truth in that. There's a certain truth. You want to get, if, if getting the job done is the most important thing, then yeah, go ahead and do it yourself. Just go ahead and do it. But there's something, and, 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 and often that'll be the case. Not always. Often there's also a, a truth that when you do it together, you know, burden shared, it's a burden lightened, etc., etc. Two brains are better than one, all those sorts of things. But the most important thing is that when we do things together, we build into one another what's in God's heart when we're doing it in Him. So that what God gives to me and what gives to Dan as we work together is much bigger than what He gives to Dan and what He gives to me. It's much, much bigger. And it's not even just Dan's bit and my bit and we pull it together because sometimes we can just pull our ignorance. So it's not just about doing that. It's about somehow when we're together and there in God, God actually does something. And, and he develops this beautiful term that we call, are now calling peopleness. We develop peopleness. And, and see, because we know God's heart, we build something bigger than my gift, my personality, my organisation. You see, whatever it means in God, the fact that this church is about to take off is 
has got more to do, has, has, hasn't got much to do with me at all. It's got to do with what God is doing amongst us. Because as we're developing people, now I don't, I'm not saying it's going to be big, small, or anything. I'm just saying it's going to take, we know what we know, we know God is doing something. We've got that sense of expectancy. Something is happening. But it will not be because of my brilliant vision or my brilliant leadership or anything else. It's to get it's what we're doing together that's going to, with God, that's going to make all this happen. Now, there's the phonetic spelling of, of, uh, of uh, now I'll, I'll, get all, I'll, get all, I'll get all tongue-tied. Um, of uh, cachet. Uh, you, can, you can say it. I'm, that's how I'm going to say it. As I'm going to try and consistently say that, but because I'm such a creative person, like, like I am with spelling, well, you know what Mark Twain once said about spelling? He said, I don't give two hoots for a man who can only spell a word one way. <laughs> so just the fact that I can vary a little bit of pronunciation around, that's just... Okay, but if you're a stickler for exact pronunciation, I've got it up there for you. Okay, so stiff-necked, hard-hearted, mean. And it's basically, it's about wanting to self-justify, wanting to say, I'm right and you're wrong. The trouble with self-justification is that, you know, well, somebody once said self-made men, the problem with self-made men is that they use faulty materials. <laughs> and and we, we, we sort of self-justify but our only justification comes from Christ that's what scripture says we're justified in Christ not justified by ourselves so we don't want to get into this sort of I've got to be right see it, it contaminates us it spoils our relationships because remember I said last week biblical literature is not a measure of our righteousness before God yet so often we can get mm, pull out a scripture and start flinging the scripture around at one another and it's, it just has no meaning and, and often we use scripture to beat one another with because we've got we're to prove, prove ourselves to be right. What's important is we need to deal with our sark. I'll come to that in a minute. Because we actually can't determine what's right and wrong. Now I know that's a shock for some Christians. Well, of course I can. I've got the Bible. I can determine what's right and wrong. Well, what happened to the Pharisees when a woman was committing adultery? Do you know what the right thing to do was? What the Bible said in those days? It said stoner. Stoner. I know what to do. The Bible says if a woman is caught in adultery, throw rocks at her. And then Jesus turned up. And he just said, fine. Anyone here who hasn't sinned, you'd be the first one to throw a rock. See, there's something, there's things that we don't know. We think we know, we actually don't know. And they really mess up our relationships. So I pose the question, could brain science at this point be relevant for understanding some things? Because I'm coming back to why we had that thing stuck, I don't know why, it's in the corner, but why we had, why we talked, we've had that chart for how long, Mary? Ten years? Probably. It's been there, it's got all these brain skills. I wonder could brain science be relevant at this point? Skill 14, remember there's 19 brain skills, skill 14 says stop the sark. Now the, ref star the sark or the flesh refers to seeing life according to our view. And we view people the same way. And so we view people and situations according to our view. And it's, it's a conviction that we feel that we can determine the right thing to do. Like the Pharisees that came to Jesus and said, this woman, she's, she's committing adultery. I know what to do at this point. We've got a rocker. We've got a stoner. That's what's going to happen at this point. And it wasn't the right thing to do at all. They just thought they knew what the right thing to do was. You see, knowing that we know what is right to do at any point in time is the opposite of skill number 13, which is heart sight or God sight. So we've got to watch out for the sark because it comes up all the time. It requires active opposition. Now a wise man once said, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, 
a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. It's from Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 to 4. There is a time for everything. There is a time for everything. So that gives us the question. Here's the question. What's the question? Pardon? How do you know exactly? How do you know what the time is? How can we tell what time it is? So Dan, when's the time to die? Come on, you're a smart man. You've got a degree. You look intelligent. Out of his hands. He doesn't know. Now, you might be able to get on okay on a time to plant. You can look up a chart. Or a time to harvest. Although even then, I'm looking at those two pumpkins out in the garden, thinking pumpkin soup will make pumpkin soup for the whole community. I said, Mary, shouldn't we pick those? Mary says, I've got to wait till they sort of turn a bit with a frost or something. You know, there's a time. Now, what, when's the right time to pick those pumpkins? Well, I reckon it's time to pick them now before someone from the pub picks them. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, there's, 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 but there's got to be. We've got to be able to work this out, you see. But we don't know. Stopping the sark starts with turning to God for guidance. I mean, isn't just, just in, time to, in the time to die, isn't it interesting how people want to determine when they die now? Next thing I'll be saying, die and say, how, I, I, not fair, I didn't, get a, I didn't get a chance to determine when I was born. Anyway, so we turn to God for guidance. Now, there are two kinds of knowing. There's one synchronization with God and his spirit. And that attunement, synchronization, getting connected with God brings wisdom, peace, and clarity into our lives. And then there's knowing what seems to be right, but in the end does not bring life. That's the sark. So what we really want in our relationships is we want to stop the sark and increase God's side. This is what I'm talking about, this letting the brain science come in when we're coming, this whole thing about dealing with our stiff nakedness and, and wanting to be right. Now, you see, I mentioned to you last week that I... I when I was, was talking about this, how the Lord said something to me about this. Now, you know that we draw on two streams. We draw on, on what we call the Wilder stream and we have the Woodroff stream. And Justin and Kevin were talking about our, con our association with Congress. Now, as I was going through some of the Wilder stuff and listening to this whole thing about community and sharing and identity with one another, I thought, oh, this is so fantastic. And this thought began to cross my mind, oh, no. What if, if only Doc could have this? Because see, Doc, like Doc agrees that identity comes from community, but Doc says this is your identity. And everything flows down from Doc. You ever notice that? Everything comes down from Doc down, and, and everything is discussed in terms, this is what Doc has said, and that, that's Doc. And I'm saying, Lord, but listen to what, what this Wilder, what Wilder's saying. Is, this, this rings so true, and this is so exciting. This is what God said to me. Why can't I do it differently? If I choose to operate one way through Woodroff and another through Wilder, it does not mean one is better than the other, although it may seem that way to you. Leave that bit to me. Pull your head in, is what he was saying. Pull your head in. You know nothing. That's true. When we get to that point, that's what Justin's talking about becoming like dust. Pull your head in. Except he was very gracious. He didn't say pull. He, he's, he's gone close to telling me to pull my head in. So, you know, anyway. It does not mean one is better than the other, although it might seem that way to you. Leave that bit to me and think of the privilege you have to be able to experience both. You want to be cut to the quick? That's what cut me to the quick. Hey, what an experience. We stand right at that that, that um, convergence of, of, of two streams of thought. I've showed you before the picture of the Rio Negro River and the Amazon, and they've come from two different areas. So one's got black soil, so it's really black. The other one's got brown soil, it's really brown. And at, one, at some point they flow together, but for some many kilometres you can see the two rivers just flowing together side by. You can actually see that's the Rio Negro and that's the Amazon. 
You can look it up and you can Google it and you can see it. And then ultimately they merge together as one. And, and we are there right at that point being able to draw. For you, you and I are so privileged. I mean, how, why, why us? What a, what a privilege. I just think it's incredible. Anyway, I digress. Um, coming back to this cachet, it's our own sense of what is right rather than what God says. And we, we talk, talked about that giving example of the woman with adultery. When we can lower our cliché, our need to be right, our need to be my way, that means we, we start to lower all the hurtful ways we treat one another. And, and that's all we want to get to. We, we want to have a low cliché in this place. We don't want to be having to be right. Okay, remember the relational sandwich? You've got a problem, you don't ignore the problem. You simply make it the relationship more important than the problem. Okay, the relationship becomes more important than the problem. And we've taught you how to do that. And if you've forgotten, we can teach you again. Okay, now we talked about how to address somebody who's stiff-necked. You don't need much, or sorry, if you don't have much hesed for someone, it's not hard to tell them to lower their cachet. In other words, if you don't have much of a relationship, I can ease, if I had no relationship with Susan, I'd say, ah, you did it wrong. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it's no... It's easy to do that, isn't it? When you've got relationship, it can be much harder. Um, particularly if that person you have a relationship with is trouble. And you've got to be able to... I don't know some of you in this situation, in some of your relationships, and it's, like, it's almost like they bring demons or addictions or toxicity into your life. And yet you can't, you, you're sort of, you're locked in. Now, if you've got sticky attachment, you can speak the truth in love. Because no matter what happens, you're sticky together. Now, this is an interesting thing, and it's worth, I've mentioned this last week, but it's worthwhile going through it again. It doesn't mean that there's no consequences. Some relationships might just be, look, I'm sorry, there's certain consequences at this point that we actually have to work through. It doesn't change the fact that I'm sticky attached to you. Um, I gave the example of the, of the elder who was training Jim Wilder and he told Jim, he said, look, my daughter's been kicked out of the church. He said, I can handle that. What I can't handle is that the church is not weeping till she comes back. So that sticky love. Well, that was the sticky love was missing. Yes, she had to be put out like the, like the, the guy, the Paul writing to the Corinthians, get rid of this guy, the disgrace, kick him out. His next letter is, for goodness sake, get him back. See, this, this is not just a... This, this is things you've got to think about, dwell upon, work through. This is not just a love everybody message. I'm, I'm getting into the nitty-gritty of what love really is. That love transforms character. It may not transform the character of the other person, but it'll transform your character. <coughs> now... Remember I said last week as a leader, I, now you'll never guess what happened to me, Monday. I should have known it was coming. I knew, I could have known this dead set, this is coming. See, when I start to preach and share things Sunday, I know that if it hasn't already hit me, it's going to hit me at some point. So as a leader, I said, I need to know if I'm causing any problems in the community. I need to know if there's anything that's not showing the full character of Christ. And I need to know that you can do it with the sense of the, that the wrong I'm doing is not the real me. Because when I'm not, when I'm doing wrong, it's not the real me. Because the real me is actually living like Christ. Because that's how I'm meant to be. Don't, I'm not saying the real me is I always live like Christ. I'm just saying that's the real me. So I'm doing something wrong. Well, it's not the real me because I'm not living from the place, the heart that Jesus gave me. So Monday morning, I'm talking to the little group we have, the executive group we're talking about, and I'm all excited, I'm as excited as a pig in mud, because um, not only we got this concept about Dan's place, and we've worked it through, because we've discussed it for a number of long, long, many, many months, and got it down on paper, and I'm also coming, I've got another idea coming out of these um, journey groups that, that Kate referred to, and I'm really excited, I come in and sit the team down, and I go bang, 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 and then I said, and you guys could lead these things. 
and I'm looking at people and they're just, they're just looking at me. Oh, well, I'm in trouble. They're just looking. And Kate had, Kate, Kate had said to me a little bit earlier, Max, you need a little, in the, in the, in the journey groups, they have a little thermometer, a picture of a thermometer, and if you overwhelm anybody, you hold up the thermometer, they help with stuff. And Kate had just said to me, Max, I think you might need a thermometer. And, um, and then, then, um, um, Kath, you know how Kath is so gracious? You know, you, she could, she could tell you, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to shoot you now. It's, I know it's, it, it'll, it'll, look, it'll sort of, you know, just, just the way life is, you know, but, and she'll do it this most graceful way. And you say, oh, yeah, please shoot me, shoot me, oh, please. <coughs> so Kate was very graciously able to tell me that I'd been overwhelming everybody and I was way ahead that I need to slow down and come back. We're like, boom. And it didn't hurt me. It didn't actually hurt me. How about that? I mean, you could say in one sense, I was being corrected. But it didn't feel like I was being corrected. It's been told, you're too overwhelming. Slow down, boy. Chill out for a while. So, I just thought you shouldn't, I thought you'd like to know that. Because um, we, we talk about good shame, a good shame message for all of us. Okay, if we need to know how to behave in any situation, sometimes we have to be able to tell other people, hey, that's not how we behave. That's not how you and the people of this community, our people, do those things. That's all. Anyway. Try and do this in the next five to seven minutes. The measure of Hesed in our community is how well do we love our enemies? How well do you love your enemies? Now, whether any religion as far as I know, of all the world's religions say, love your enemy. Most religions would say love your neighbour, but Jesus said love your enemy as you love yourself. So we're supposed to attach to our enemies. I mean that's what martyrs, we read Prince of stories of martyrs who are praying for the people who are killing them and persecuting them. Obviously Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's loving your enemy, isn't it? That's being attached. See, we need to be able to have this attitude to our enemies that says, God loves you and I intend to love you as well. Now, who are our enemies? Well, our enemies are the people who do not have our best interests at heart. Okay, okay yeah, maybe. I don't know about you. If I just had to think of who my enemies might be at this point in time, I actually can't think of any. I don't know of any that I would actually say, this person are my enemies. So that lets me off the hook. It's easy for me. But then, who is my enemy? Well, think about this. Whenever your spouse, your parents, your kids, your friends, your workmates, or members of this community irritate, harm, disobey, lie, overwhelm, hit, become angry, sarcastic, tease, etc., etc., and we cannot regulate our emotional response at that point, it feels like they're our enemy. Agreed? Because when you, when, when it's like when someone does something to you, might be your kids, spouse, best friend, anything, someone does something to you and it overwhelms you and, or you, you are now overwhelmed and you can't control your emotional response, at that point you want to kill them. Now, not physically, but at that point, you just do not want, you just, you want to be able to <coughs> do something. Hair said, says, no, we will love them. We will love them. Even when they do something like that. That's the first thing. Now, when that happens, we have this thing called our VLE, our, 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 our um, verbal logical explainer, which will justify whatever we do. And it's usually in some way or other we'll hurt people. We'll justify whatever we do at that point 
because these kids are messing up. They're fighting and I'm driving. So whatever I do at that point, where I'm overwhelmed, not saying whatever you do necessarily, but if I'm overwhelmed, then I'll be able to justify that for all these good reasons. And that's not loving our enemies. Sometimes all it takes is a little correction. A little story. Uh, we've been looking after Cecilia's cat, as you know. Cecilia's our second daughter. Looking after Cecilia's cat in a house in Sydney. And we take it in turns. Now, I'm thinking, great, when I get down there, I get a space. I get some clear space. Chris is at work, Lucy's in Canberra, don't have to pick up the kids, don't have to cook meals. Don't, don't, I've got all this space, all this time in the world. So I think, great. So come Wednesday, I drive down, Mary drives back, I think beauty. A little time just chilling out, drink a bit of coffee, you know, and then just start doing a little bit of work and just chilling out, just easing into all the things I want to do, all this next wonderful two days, at least two days, maybe three days, I'm going to have just there by myself able to work. Thursday afternoon, you get a call from Mary. I'm sick. Can you come home? I don't even have a car. At this point, I've got to catch a train and all the rest of it. Go through that process. So there goes all my plans about all the things it's going to do, all the it's going to get X, Y, and Z done, and all this sort of stuff. And so, okay, of course I cheerfully go. I mean, I was pretty good about it. I wasn't sort of snarling, but that was okay. But then the next day I'm waking up and I'm thinking, I've got this to do, this to do. Again, I think Molly Joy had choir, so I had to get the kids off to school by half past seven, make their lunches, make all that sort of stuff. Mary's sick, all this process. And so there goes some more time and then all these things I can't get done. Hey, I've got to go through the books and got to do this and got to do this and got to do this. And, um, and then something else had happened that was, it was costing me some money. And I went in to say to Mary, I'm just feeling, oh, I'm just like, um, you know, this has happened. And, and all, all I wanted was to Mary to say, you know, that's tough and blah, blah, blah and just, you know, whatever and pat me on the back and say, it's okay. And because it was related to a fine that was something I hadn't, information hadn't given the RTA so now I've got a big fine and all the rest of it. And Mary said, why don't, why don't you get it done? Why don't you do it? Oh, well, you know, blah, 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 rushing around doing all those things to do. And she made some yeah, really helpful comment about, well, you know, you could organize yourself a bit better. It was all done quite, just, you know how Mary, Mary's matter of fact. So in Mary's matter of fact, look, you know, boom, boom, boom. Well, it, what she said was right, but it wasn't what I wanted. But at that point, I was backbone a little boy, baby because I couldn't say, excuse me, mummy, I actually want you just to give me a cuddle and make me feel good. But because I couldn't say that, I just quietly got out of the chair and just walked out and just sat by myself and cooked or stewed <laughs> and just sat there, uh, you know, oh, I wanted was a bit of... You see, it can only take sometimes just a little correction. And suddenly, my wife's my enemy. Now, I know I'm the only one that ever happens to, <laughs> but I'm just sharing to you, this is what us mere mortals have to put up with that you people have already conquered and are charging headstrong on. Somehow when we make someone our enemy, we still have to love them. Now, love means I'm glad to be with you, isn't it? Even when and I'm not getting what I thought I should have got. And you say to me, not practical, it's totally impractical. You don't know my put in your spouse, your kids, your parents, your friends, your church, your pastor, whatever, when he, she, they do whatever, 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 at that point I have to correct them, get angry, sulk, leave, get even, etc., etc., etc. Well, it doesn't matter 
how impractical it seems, Jesus said, love your enemies. When we don't love our enemies, we're malfunctioning as humans. Might have been a good message to miss today. <laughs> when we don't love our enemies, we're malfunctioning as humans. So brain skills are important. You see, brain skill number 13 says, is God's sight. If we saw people the way God sees them, we could not help but love them. Think about that. Next time you have an enemy, say, God, how do you see these people? What's your view of this person that I am right now really upset with? How do you see them? See, when you are upset, it's important not just to validate your feelings, but to also ask the question, how am I going to love my enemy? That's why two-way speaking is so important. That's why we stress the Sunday nights. So we talk about this stuff, not just because we think it's a good idea. It actually will affect the way you live. It will transform the way you live. It will transform your relationships. See, if we can't do this to people that we're close to, how can we do it to people who have bad intentions towards us? Because there will be people like that. You see, <coughs> whether you've hurt me or not, God's put you in my life. That's got to be my attitude. We don't want this. In fact, we can't have sticky attachments without joy. And it's not about loving, making us, trying to make ourselves love our enemies. It's about how well we're attached. So if you're in a situation where you've got, stick, you got her said, you've got sticky attachment to somebody, but they're driving you nuts, and they may be even harmful to you, just give thanks to God. Claim a scripture. God said, in this life you will have suffering. So you can claim one of God's promises. I claim that promise, Lord. I'm having suffering. When you claim all the others, why not claim that one? Why, why, why cherry pick the promises of God? Claim your suffering. Be joyful. God, you've given me sufficient grace to enable me to get through into this situation. The fact that God's called you for one of his tougher assignments doesn't mean you won't have to suffer. And joy does not mean you're alone. Sorry, joy means you're not alone. It doesn't mean there's no suffering. Now, now I'm going to take a few minutes just to go in this because I want to complete something in this about, I don't want to leave you up there because we're actually getting to a finish with this as well in terms of what you can do. Now, if you don't know how to bond to somebody, you won't, be, won't have sticky attachment because if you don't know how to bond to connect with somebody, you'll have trouble with sticky attachments and you're going to have trouble with loving your enemies. Now, interesting, there's another brain skill for that. So brain skill number three says, form bonds for two people. So forming a bond means that you're able to share and respect someone else's signals and their limitations. So you, you are aware of what's happening with somebody. So that means that you don't intrude because of your own anxiety. In other words, oh, gee, Mary looks a bit cross today. Uh, better try and find out what's the matter, Mary, what's going on? Nothing. Oh, you look cross. Nothing wrong with me. But I'm anxious because I'm feeling insecure. So, you know what I mean? You, know, you, can, you can sort of do that. You try to, try to you, you own anxiety. What's happened about this? What's happened about that? And it's, you're actually trying to calm your own anxiety. Or, or, um, not ex or, or making sure, you see, able to share and respect another signals and limitations, respect someone else's weakness. If somebody's weak in an area, cover them. We're not going, to, not going to hammer people for their weakness. Remember, we have a tender response to weakness. When you have a bond between two people, you're able to express feelings, thoughts, and words. So if you can't do this and you bond with somebody that's important, that's they've, they've put some of the skills that you need. Allowing another person to experience personal space. Don't crowd people. Give people room. That means you don't control people. You don't manipulate people through force or anger or sympathy. You know, like, poor old me, oh, poor old me, nobody loves me. Oh, no, no. That's just a form of manipulation. When you do that, you get a mutual mind state, like, like exists between a mother and a baby where there's a secure attachment. You have a feeling you're connected, you're understood, and you're valued. It'll help you to develop deep bonds with other people and there'll be a true sense of security. And that starts 
with a secure relationship between the mother and the baby. So if you've missed out on that, if you missed out on a secure relationship between your mother and yourself, you're going to have a few problems. You're going to need to catch up on some things and there's going to be important things that we do as well. These are some of the things that happen when you don't have a good secure bond, you don't have an identity, you lack security, you've got pain, it's emotional pain, you tend to be isolated, you feel rejected, you've got grudges, fear, resentments, disconnectedness and self-centeredness. It's not a real character reference that you want, is it? There's, there's some things that we'd like to change in that. Okay, so if you are lacking in those things, I'm just going through stuff we've done before, but I just want to show you there is answers to these things. If you're lacking, these are things that need to happen that you need to work on and this community needs to work on for you. You need to build joy strength. You need to know how to receive things with joy. You need to be able to return to joy from every unpleasant emotion. You need to learn to synchronize with others, to regulate your emotions, to learn to be the same person over time and to learn to rest. Now, all I'm doing is plugging out all the stuff that we've talked about, all the stuff that we've trained you to say actually has applicability in the way that we relate and the way that this community operates. Can you hear me in this? Because it's so important. We're talking about being a sanctuary. We're talking about being a place where sharks can come in here and we will accept them. We open the doors and say open for business. People who may be um, predatorial in their social behaviour, we actually have to make room for them. We have to make room for all sorts of people. We're not screening them at the door. So these things, all these things are important and they've been part of your ongoing training for the last X number of years. Another brand skill is appreciation. Remember we're talking about how we form sticky attachments. We're talking about how we can live in a community where we can, um, w where we don't have the SARC ruling, where we don't try to work out wh where we think we know what's best. We're, we're talking about where we can form bonds with not just two people, with all sorts of people. All these things are important because we're learning how to love one another. Now, appreciation. Appreciation, this is the number, if you do nothing else, if you do nothing else, can I encourage you, practice appreciation. If you're not good at it, do it three times a day. Three times, three times a day. So it becomes part of the way you live. Does all sorts of incredible things. They're up there. I don't want to go through them now, but it does, just does incredible things. I'll send you the PowerPoint. You can read it later because we're running out of time. But this skill is a game changer in all your relationships. It's absolutely essential. Now, just to finish, because this is part of where I want to get to finally. All those things, those brain skills, forming bonds, appreciation, um, even to a lesser extent, but this would come in at stopping the sark and, and um, God's sight. There's a very simple thing that we can do that will enable it to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about this, just I'm not, we're not going to sort of, I'll just touch on it today and we'll work on it a bit more later on. But Kate mentioned checking in when she talked about the journey groups. And we check in, when I check in on Monday, when Mary and I check into our group on Tuesday night, we are going to say, this is how we're feeling. We'll actually describe how we're feeling. Now, if you're not used to doing that, you just say, you, you keep it fairly you know, low key. But we just describe how we're feeling and what led to how we're feeling at the particular time. So the first time I did it, I said, look, I'm fantastic, I'm excited, I'm so wonderful, looking forward to this, blah, blah, blah. The next week when I shared last Tuesday, I said, I'm actually feeling, I've got a good dose of hopeless despair, and this is why. Now, what's the, what's the beauty of this? It's a powerful way to grow your relational skills and connections. And you can do it by phone, email, or per, in person. And I'm going to talk later on, but not today because we ran out of time. We're going to talk about us actually having a checking in partner. Because these are the things that it does. It reminds us that our core goal is to express joy in our relationships with each other and God and identify where we are on the emotional map. 
By regularly listening and sharing our hearts, friends, couples, households and small groups are given a natural yet transformational tool that helps them practice many relational brain skills such as joy, quiet, appreciation, bonds to two, family bonds and recovering from complex emotions. Okay, so you see, you, you think about this. You came to church today. I came to church, I was up at five o'clock. I waited, welcomed my daughter home from overseas. I uh, gave myself breakfast, did some work, preparation for church, and I drove from Sydney down to here. Where am I? Where am I focused? Am I necessarily focused relationally? And then I've got to make sure everything's just ready for this to go. And, and then you've come, and some of you have had a fight with your kids, you've had a fight with your husband, your wife had a fight with your car tried to get all the washing done before you left went to the markets and bought some honey any of those things any of those things you're not necessarily coming ready to relate checking in makes you very relational that helps because it's such a key in us becoming the community that God wants us to be amen so now I've, I've had to sort of pack a bit in but there's lots of stuff if you go through that there's very practical things you can pluck out and say I can apply this I can start applying this in my life because I want to see more and more people in this this is what I want to become. Amen? So, God love you all.